So far we've taken a look at the Biot-Savar law and applied it to situations of a long straight wire, a arc of wire, and circles of wire and solenoids. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce Ampere's law. So if you remember when we came up with Gauss's law, um, we, we started with um, Coulomb's law for electric fields and got Gauss's law. But it turned out that Gauss's law was the for, more fundamental thing. This is going to be the exact same kind of thing. Um, Ampere's law was historically obtained from the Biot-Savar law. Um, using similar kind of tricks, although it's not going to be surfaces that are involved here, um, but using similar kinds of mathematical tricks, you can take the Biot-Savar law and come up with Ampere's law, which again turns out to be the more fundamental statement. The Biot-Savar law is limited to what's called the magnetostatic regime which is where all of your charges are moving slow compared to the speed of light. Whereas Ampere's law is always true regardless of how fast the charges are moving. So with that as background here, let's just imagine that we got a bunch of wires here that are all carrying currents. Uh, let's say I1, I2. We'll make I3 point the other way, I4 point this way again. So what you do is instead of a surface, you pick what's called an Ampereian path. So let's make our Ampereian path look, say, something like this. So this is going underneath my lines, and then I'm going to give it just a little bit of loopiness here just to show it doesn't have to be any special shape. And our Ampereian path also has to have an orientation. This is going to turn out to be our direction of integration. Um, now what this is also going to do is it's going to decide which of our currents are positive and which are negative. So it'll turn out that, again, similar to Gauss's law, if the current does not pass through the Ampereian path, it doesn't count. So, sorry, I won, but you don't count. Now here, what the rule is, is again, you curl the fingers of your right hand to match the Ampereian path, and the direction that your thumb points would be positive. So that will make my current I2 a positive current, and I4 will also be a positive current, but I3 will be a negative current. So with that, we can write that the integral of the magnetic field at every point along my Empyrean path dotted with my differential displacement, ds, will be equal to mu naught times the total current through the Empyrean path using the plus and minus sign convention that I just described. So again, Curl the fingers of your right hand to follow the Empyrean path. Your thumb points along positive. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and revisit our friend the wire. But this time, we will do it both inside and outside the wire. So first we'll do outside the wire. So let's say that we have a wire, and let's say the current coming, I'll draw a bunch of dots here. Let's say the current is coming out of the wire, coming out of the screen like that. So this is our wire. 
um, we're looking at in cross section. So it's running in and out of the screen. Um, let's say the wire has a radius big R. So by using the right hand rule, you should be able to convince yourself that outside the wire, sorry, using the hitchhiker rule, using placing your thumb along the direction of the current in the wire, the magnetic field lines will be circles that are oriented counterclockwise. And let's say that this distance here will dimension this radius out to be our little r. Now we can use the um, Ampere's law to get this. So the idea is that any point along here, let's just mark a little, um, whoops, a little chunk along our Amperian path ds, like say this chunk right there. Um, what I'm going to do, or sorry, let me first make an Amperian path, my apologies. In this case, I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to make an Amperian path that follows what I already know the magnetic field line is going to do. And this is generally what you're going to want to do. You know, let symmetry tell you what the magnetic field is doing, and then you pick the Amperian path to match. So again, the Amperian path here is a totally made up hypothetical mathematical path that in this case we are using to match the magnetic field line that we know is there. So here's my chunk of displacement D, my differential displacement DS. And at that location, the magnetic field strength will be B, whatever it is. So we can go ahead and apply Ampere's law for this. So this is going to be integral B dot DS equals mu naught times I through. So first off here, B and DS point in the same direction. So B dot DS is just B times DS. And the magnetic field strength is a constant by the symmetry of the situation. So I can write this as inner B times the integral ds. Um, this will equal mu naught times the current going through. Well, the current's coming out of the screen. If I take the fingers of my right, if I take my right hand and curl them so that my fingers match my Empyrean path going counterclockwise here, my thumb points out of the screen. So out, out of the screen is the positive direction, so this will be a plus i for my i through. Well, this integral ds is just going to be the circumference of the circle. You know, if I integrate this over an entire circle, I'm just going to get 2 pi r. So I get that b times 2 pi um, r is equal to mu naught i or b is equal to mu naught over 2 pi i over r, which is exactly what we got before. But now, what we can do is we can go ahead and extend this to looking inside the wire and see what happens. So let me make the wire super duper extra jumbo big. So it's still carrying our current I. It's still got a radius of big R. And I'm still going to say that the current is coming out of the screen like so. And in DC current, the current will be uniformly distributed across the wire. In AC, it isn't, but that's beyond the scope of what we're going to be doing here. So, 
let's say we want to know what the magnetic field strength is, um, say at this point right here, um, some distance little r away again. So let's dimension in a little r here. Um, so again, it's going to be the same deal. Um, if I look at this, I can go ahead and set up an Empyrean path nice circular one so that it follows the symmetry. Um, and then what I realize is that the current outside the path doesn't count, but there is current inside the path. And we know if I put my thumb along that current and do the hitchhiker rule thing, I know that I'm still going to have a magnetic field line inside the wire. That's going to be a circle going around counterclockwise. So if that's going to be counterclockwise, I will want my Empyrean path <coughs> to have a matching counterclockwise orientation. So again, it's going to be the same deal. I can pick a chunk DS here and note that the magnetic field strength at that location, whatever it is, is B. So now I can set up the integral the same. Um, Integral b dot ds is equal to mu naught times i through. In exactly the same way we did it before, we're going to get that this is b times 2 pi r. So I'll just reuse that result. But now what I have to do is I have to figure out how to express the current going through the Empyrean path in terms of the whole current. And what I can do is I can recognize that the current going through the Empyrean path is to the current as the area enclosed by the Empyrean path is to the area, cross-sectional area of the wire. I can cancel pi's and get that I through is I times R squared over R squared. So I'll put that in I R squared over R squared like that. And so when I rearrange it around, let's see, I can cancel an R there. I get that B is equal to mu naught over two pi I times R over R squared. Now remember with these things here that if you're right at the edge, that is the transition point between inside and outside the wire, and you should get the same result. So here I had I over big R. And here, if I put in big R for little r, of course, by being right at the edge, I'll end up with I over R again. So the, um, the boundary points check, so that makes us feel like we've got something uh, going good here. So. What we get is that if I plot my magnetic field strength as a function of distance, and let's do this in units of, radi of radius, so 3r, 4r, the magnetic field strength increases to some maximum value. Um, that maximum value right here will be mu naught over 2 pi i over big R. Um, I'm sorry here. This should be a little r right there. I should be dividing by. My apologies. I'm sure you all caught that. Please don't roast me over it. Okay, um, so right where little r is equal to big R, that's our maximum value there. And then when I'm two times the radius of the wire away, we've already dropped to a half of the original val of that value, and then down to a ninth, and then down to, uh, I'm sorry, a third, we've dropped to a half, and then a third, and then maybe like a Order or something like that. So 
this bit here goes as directly as R and this bit here goes as 1 over R. And the fact that there is a magnetic field inside the wire really does matter. Um, turns out that this magnetic field inside the wire is part of the reason why incandescent uh, light bulbs fail. Um, because the current passing through the filament interacts with the, with the field. That, that's part of it. Um, it's also an issue when designing um, very high... Um, the very high uh, current carrying wires. At this point, they basically look like just pure copper pipes. And in fact, they often run distilled water right down the hollow sections on the inside of the pipe to cool it down enough to keep it from melting. One of the other issues they have to worry about is um, magnetic interactions will cause the... Um, the wire itself to want to crush as you uh, bring the current up and so they sometimes have to do things like insert carbon fiber spacers and the like to uh, provide additional strength. Finally let's go and revisit our solenoid. So again, for our solenoid, remember, I'm just going to do a horrible job of drawing them. Um, something like that. So each of these is a winding of my solenoid, and I am drawing the wires really thick because I don't want to sit here and draw them forever. Um, again, let's say the current is going out of the screen at the top, into the screen at the bottom. So they'll be down, pointing down for the part of the loop in front of the screen and pointing up for the part of the loop behind the screen. So overall, let's say that this has a length L and that there are a total of N turns to our solenoid. Now we argued that inside the solenoid, um, the magnetic field was basically uniform inside the solenoid. In the limit of the solenoid getting longer and longer and longer, the magnetic field outside will get weaker and weaker and weaker. Um, so in the limit of a very long solenoid, we can approximate the magnetic field outside the solenoid as being basically zero. So then what we can do is we can make a rectangular Amperian path like so. And so along the four legs here, here I'm orienting it so that the path follows the field inside. My DS will point in the same direction as my B so b dot ds here will just be b times ds. Here, um, inside the solenoid, my ds here will be pointing down or at the course matching thing here up. Um, but my magnetic fields are still pointing to the right. So these are 90 degree angles. So here, um, at this, for this chunk of path here, B dot DS is equal to zero here because it's a right angle. And same deal here because it's a right angle, B dot DS is equal to zero. Here, because the two are parallel, 
b dot ds is equal to just plain b ds. Now here, because the magnetic field is just plain zero, um, b dot ds is going to be zero just because you are dotting zero into something. So you time something by zero, you get zero. Yeah, I know that's really profound. So when we set up Ampere's law for this, we're going to have integral b dot ds is equal to um, mu naught times i through the Amperian path. path. So um, so sorry, I should have made the, I'm going to make my, this distance L, the length of my Amperian path. Um, it doesn't change anything because we're pretending the solenoid goes on forever anyway. There. Um, so this is going to just be B dotted b times ds in this bit here. b is a constant, so integral ds is just l. So this is bl. And then here, mu naught i through, well, we have n turns of wire in length l times the current. Each one of them contributes. So we can divide through by l and get that b is equal to mu naught n over l times i. Now since we're approximating this as a basically infinite solenoid, usually what you do is you focus on the turns per unit length and you rewrite this as mu naught lowercase n i. Either form is fine. Little n here is the number of turns per unit length, so that's just big N over L. Following the usual physics rule of thumb, that if you have a lower case line, it's the upper case line divided by something. So again, just to get some sense of scale for this, let's imagine that you have a solenoid with say 10,000 churns, which is very easily done by uh, just using very thin magnet wire. Um, you can space a lot of churns really close to each other. Um, let's say that this is done over 10 centimeters, so 0.1 meters. Um, then the magnetic field strength you'll get is um, mu naught, which is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meters per amp um, times we will have 10,000 churns over, um, let's see, we said our length was 0.1 meters. And I forgot to mention how much current we were carrying. Let's say it's 10 amps, just to make nice round numbers here. So now we're getting somewhere. This is going to be 10,000. This is 100,000. This will be a million. So that's 10 to the 6. So then this will be 4 pi times 10 to the negative 1 teslas. So 4 pi is about 12. So this would be a 1 tesla field. Okay, that's a little unrealistic. Probably more realistic is to use 1,000 turns of wire. But I lack the energy to go back and redo that. But it gives you some sense. With a lot of turns of wire, we can make ourselves a pretty sporty magnetic field. Alrighty. So I will go ahead and catch you in the next one. Have a good one.